and okay so the other day you did the little relative frequency experiment so I asked you to do uh, 30 flips of a coin hopefully you got to do this and then I asked you to combine all of your 30 flips and see what kind of totals you got and um, the point of this was that relative frequency uh, like I said is based on an experiment so when you flip a coin you expect to get heads half the time and tails the other half of the time but what you notice hopefully when you flip the coin is that that doesn't necessarily happen okay so you might have got like I don't know 12 heads out of the 30 flips and then you would have got 18 tails out of the 30 flips okay so not exactly half and half because when it's an actual experiment it doesn't always fall half and half like that but what you should notice is that as you increase the experiments so instead of doing 30 if you do you know 120 or 240 more and more and more experiments and um, it does actually get closer to the actual probability so the more experiments the closer you get to the actual probability okay and that was kind of the point of the experiment of the day so on your 30 trials you might not have been um, bang on half and half but hopefully when you start to put your trials with the person sitting beside you and behind you and the rest of the people in the class and as a result instead of having 30 trials you might have had you know 300 trials more 600 trials hopefully that got closer to half and half okay because this is a fact that the more experiments you do the closer you get to the actual probability. So you move away from an experimental probability and move towards a theoretical probability. Okay, remember the theoretical probability is what we know it is. Okay, in theory, when you flip a coin, half the time you should get heads and half the time you should get tails. In real life, in an experiment, that is not necessarily the case. But as you increase the number of trials, you actually do get closer to that half and half. Okay, so hopefully it worked out like that. Um, but that was the point of me making you do that. Um, I'm just going to grab a charger, hang on. Okay. So I just want to look at then some examples of relative frequency from your book. So first one here. A survey shows 80 out of 100 people own a car. Find the relative frequency of a person owning a car. So this is an experiment of a sort. Somebody went around and they asked 100 people, do you own a car? And that person could say yes or no. Okay. And out of the 100 people, 80 people said that they own a car. So to figure out the relative frequency, you just make that fraction. You put 80 over 100. So the relative frequency of owning a car is 80 over 100. Now, if you want, and you don't have to, you can simplify that fraction to make it 8 over 10. And it simplifies more than that, so 2 into that goes, so it could be 4 over 5. And remember, your calculator will do that for you. So if you type 80 over 100 into your calculator and press equals, it will give you 4 over 5. You could go with um, a decimal if you want, 0.8. And you could go with a percentage if you want. Okay? But the original answer is... Where's this gone? Here. The original answer is absolutely perfect. 80 out of 100 people own a car. So the relative frequency of owning a car is 80 over 100. Okay, so when you're doing relative frequency, it's the event, sorry, uh, uh, it's the event you're interested in, which in this case is um, owning a car, 
and the bottom is the total. So how many people did they ask? So all you have to do is create that fraction. You can simplify that fraction or write it as a decimal or a percentage, but I'll say it again, you do not have to. Okay? Try this one. A hurling team has won 12 games out of 25 in, a se in this season so far. Estimate the experimental probability as a decimal that they will win their next game. Okay, so we're going to do, um, now I should say, see up here it said find the relative frequency and down here it said estimate the experimental probability. So just to remind you, look at the heading, they're the same thing. So some questions will say relative frequency and some questions will say experimental probability, but they mean the same thing. Okay, so this is the same question. So again, I have to create my fraction. So to get relative frequency or experimental probability, I need to put the event I'm interested in. Over the total. Okay, so in this case, they want the experimental probability um, that they're going to win. Okay, so the event I'm interested in is them winning. And the hurling team have won 12 games. So that's the top line of my fraction, 12 wins. The total number of games out of 25 in the season, so the total number of games is 25. Okay, so there is my experimental probability. And that, in most cases, would be absolutely fine as an answer except that in this question they specifically say that they want it as a decimal. Okay, so you're going to use this button on your calculator. We talked about this last week. Put in your 12 over 25 and press equals. So 12 over 25. It will throw back the fraction, which is fine, because you just press the SD button and you should get 0.4. Oh, sorry. And there's your answer. Okay, so normally 12 over 25 would be absolutely fine, except that the question asked for a decimal. Okay? And um, yeah, I'll go on to that now. So just when I'm doing these videos, um, I sort of forgot with yourselves because I had done this with my current second and third years last year, so they're very familiar with um this whole blended learning and learning online things. So I suppose you need to kind of treat this as if we were in class. So you know the way in class I ask you to write down um, EX 8.11. You don't take down the question but you do take down my answer. Okay, it's the same thing here. Okay, you shouldn't have a blank in your notes. So when I'm speaking um, you should be writing it down. Um, hopefully if you have your earphones you'll be able to do that at your own pace. So it means you can listen to me explain it, pause it, take it down. Move on to the next example. In your copy, you'll write example 8.12. Again, you do not need to write down the question. Listen to me talk through the answer and then take down the answer down here. Okay, so your notes should look exactly the same as if we were in class. All right. Um, so I'm going to give you a few questions on um, that for your homework. Um, obviously, as soon as you're finished listening to this video, you can start doing it in class. And if you get it complete, that's great. Um, I just want to briefly, before I finish off, talk about this. Okay, so again, this is a heading and you need to take it down into your copy. Relative, frequent, relative frequency, and remember, other way of saying relative frequency is experimental probability. Okay, so don't forget that those words are interchangeable and um, that's going to be important. Okay, and then the concept of fairness is what we're bringing in here. Okay, so a couple of words and um, they talk, well, you can see here this person is rolling some dice. Okay, so if you take a single one, a single dice and you roll it, you should have an equal chance of getting a 1 or getting a 2 or getting a 3 or getting a 4 or getting a 5 or getting a 6. Okay, it should be just as likely when you roll a dice that you get a 1 as it is to get a 6. Okay, and if that's the case, then the dice is considered to be fair 
or unbiased, okay? So if the, and this is what you need to take down, if the outcomes are equally likely to occur, then the dice is fair or unbiased, okay? I don't know if you've ever heard of a weighted die. Um, it's basically a dice that you cheat with because it would be weighted to land on a six more than anything else, okay? That is an unfair die if it's weighted or it's classed as biased, okay? So it's only considered fair if each outcome on the dice or each side of the coin is equally likely, okay? We'll have a look at a little example. So a spinner with sectors labeled A to D is spun. So this is a spinner, it's spun a thousand times and the relative frequencies are recorded in the table. Using relative frequencies determine if the spinner is fair. So remember it's only fair if each outcome is equally likely. So let's do each outcome. So A appeared 340 times out of a thousand. Oh, a thousand. B appeared 180 times out of a thousand. C appeared 250 times out of a thousand. And D appeared 230 times out of a thousand. Now you might be able to answer this already, but I'm just going to um, multiply these by 100 and make them percentages. I just think percentages are nice to deal with, a bit nicer than fractions. So if I type in 340 over 1000 and I multiply by 100, this is 34%. If I do 180 divided by 1000 and multiply by 100, I get 18%. This one is 25% and this one is 23%. So using this spinner, the chances of getting an A or landing on A in the spinner is 34%. The chances of landing on B is 18%. You will land on C 25% of the time and you will land on D 23% of the time. So is this spinner fair? No, it's not. It's not fair because all of these percentages are different. And remember, in order to be fair, all of those percentages should have been the same. Okay, so no, that spinner is not fair. It is a biased spinner. Okay, so I'm going to give you a few questions, as I said, to do on relative frequency. Um, and we'll, we'll mark them. I know I have some of you tomorrow and some of you Friday, but I'll mark them at the beginning of the video on Thursday or Friday. Okay, so do your homework. I'll have it up as an assignment on Schoology. So I know some of you have noticed I've started uploading to Schoology. So if you can do that, that would be great. If you could complete the homework, take a picture and upload to Schoology, that would be amazing because it means I can see your work and I can give you some feedback on it. So that would be brilliant to see um, if you can figure out how to do that. And um, perhaps if you can't, maybe somebody who has figured it out might stand up and demonstrate it to the class, um, which would be brilliant. Um, so yeah, I would love to be able to see your work if possible. And um, so if you could start taking pictures with those iPads and uploading to the Schoology assignments, that would be amazing. Okay, so I'll be back in touch either Thursday or Friday.